to Mr. Shipman's class. I am so blessed and proud to be here to welcome you to this great podcast. One more time, I am here with the lovely, beautiful, and talented Miss Prudence Williams. Hello, world. Um, Dr. Shipman. Yes, ma'am. Today mm-hmm. is a good day. It's a great day. And today I'm so happy to be here making this pod class. I want everybody to go out and check you out on our social media. Yes. We're on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. All you got to do is search Terrence Shipman. You can also check us out at TerrenceShipman.com. That is T-E-R-A-N-C-E-S-H-I-P-M-A-N.com. And if you want to get your get a book for the holidays... If you want to get December celebrations or the first day of school at autograph copy, go ahead and place your order on my website. We have orders coming in right now. Every week it seems like I'm going to the post office several times. And that's a good thing. It's a blessing. So please go ahead and place your order now before the holidays. So Dr. Shipman, today we're going to talk about a subject that is good when used well and not so good when not used well. We're talking about professional learning communities. Yes, ma'am. Professional learning communities for the population out there who doesn't teach are meetings that teachers have. And it's not the whole school. It may be a department like science or social studies or language arts. And it is generally done by grade level. And it is, well, not always. It can be done by grade level. And it is an area where teachers help each other learn. They're designed for teachers to help other teachers learn to be better teachers. Yes, ma'am. Um, actually, when they first started years ago, we've both been teaching a long time, mm-hmm. so they've been around for a while. They started informally. Um, I remember when I was a very young teacher back in the 90s, uh, 1994, I graduated. I was put under the wing of some more advanced teachers Who would say things like, you know, if you don't mind, a better way of doing that would be, and they would give you suggestions. And they would observe your teaching. Mm -hmm. And you would observe their teaching. And together you grew and you learned how to teach. I think it used to help me out a lot because I taught kindergarten. So I was able to go observe my two mentor teachers or my teammates. Because the paraprofessional will hold the class why you go observe other teachers teach. Uh, and then you can always have, the, the most important time was to be able to just sit and talk and reflect and, you know, talk about your day or talk about what you saw, how you can use it. But now it has turned to a whole different ball game. Well, when they originally started, they were definitely safe places for young teachers to come and admit their weaknesses and their flaws that they had already seen in themselves and to safely ask for help without worrying about being um, criticized, reprimanded, or even disciplined. I mean, teaching, unfortunately, comes with very little training. You go through education school, which teaches you more of the philosophy of how to teach. Mm -hmm. You may be lucky enough to do some small in-class experiences, but until you land on your feet in a classroom, there's nothing like it. And I always say to people, uh, most people's experience in a classroom is on the student side of the desk. And until you cross over to the teacher side of the desk, you really have no idea what's going on in the classroom. Students think they know, but there's so many little underlying things going on that the teacher is holding, got a lot of balls in the air juggling, trying to make sure nothing falls. So PLCs, when they first started, were really, really positive 
way to help young teachers learn, first of all, all the different um, facets of education that you didn't realize were going on as a student or even as a parent. For instance, um, in one right now, in one classroom, I have one student who has some emotional issues and cuts herself. Two students who are suicidal. One student who has some other issues that doesn't allow him to sit next to... He can't sit in the middle of a group. Mm -hmm. So if you have a row, he has to be on one end. He cannot sit in the middle. It makes him very anxious. And also, you know, I have learning needs... Uh, students with learning disabilities and get the students in the same class and, and you know you're trying to meet every kid's needs and it gets hard so PLCs were a wonderful place to help teachers learn how to manage all those things or, or, uh, uh, give me, let me give you another example on when we used to do it on the elementary level you know we all taught the same core subjects math, reading social studies, science but most of that math and reading and we all, we had different classes. Everybody had different kids at different levels. So we were able to say, okay, we making the same lesson plans, but we're all going to do them different. We're going to try different things. So each week, we we all took the same test at the end of the week, but we taught it different. We got back, we got back with each other and talked about the different lessons and say, hey, how did this work with your group? Your group scored high. So next time, we're going to try data. that. Right. So we're exchanging data in the meetings. And then the other blessing was that team used to stay together for a year, for one or two, three years. The principals then switched the team up. So each year you grew and you were able to improve your lessons because you kept the same lesson plans. You knew what would work. You only made changes because some of the students might have changed tremendously but oh you found that something just flat out didn't work right and you were able to take we used to keep these wonderful little notebooks and journals Mm -hmm. and you were able to take notes and say okay this sounds like a great idea and in theory it is but when you put it in practice it doesn't work unless you do and you make those tweaks Uh and adjustments and for the next year to improve so plc's had an honest and good started they were started by teachers for teachers and they helped teachers. There was very little administrative input on them. However, um, as the ball rolls, as the days fold, as time moves on, things do change. And now we still have PLCs, but unfortunately, and I admit it just that way, it is an unfortunate thing. I've seen nothing good of this change. PLCs now are very much mandated by upper management and upper leadership. And I'm talking the state is telling us how to do them. This year in the state of Georgia and last year and the previous year, probably for the last three years, they have put out these videos that show you how to do a PLCs. And they require that you have an agenda, make minutes. And it has become very micromanaged to the point where in some schools they tell you where to meet. And the administrator is sitting there with you. Some schools, wait a minute. As far as I know, all schools, because they continue, you have to meet. I remember um, a couple years ago. So they was trying to give have a going away party for one of the staff members. And uh, they were going to have it in the PLC room. And the administrator came in there and she was getting ready to have a meeting in there. But this party was playing way in advance, and she knew they were going to have it in there. She said, oh, no, this room cannot be used for parties. This is a PLC room. We would have we have to have a meeting here. And we're sitting there like... Uh, that's the interesting thing, because when they started, they definitely were um, community building events and having a going away party or a maternity leave going away party mm-hmm. was perfectly a part of the PLC because it it made it safe for teachers to do things for each other and it made young fee- teachers know where understand that they weren't competing against the old teachers they weren't challenging the old teachers with new ideas 
it built communities. And I think that's why they say communities. And right. now we can't even do that because it's being managed by the administrators so much. You, we, like at uh, one of the school that I'm at, you have, we have at least once a month try to have a potluck dinner, lunch. But the problem comes with this. Uh, like, matter of fact, we have one plan for this week. The problem becomes what day are we going to have it on? Because we're meeting on Monday. We're meeting on Tuesday. How many PLCs do y'all have a week? We have... Mandated. Mandated. Two. We do two. Mandated. We We uh, have two. We're not talking about RTI. Our tab two, level two, or level three meetings. RTI for me. Yeah, Yeah, RTI two is on Mondays. RTI three is on Fridays. So it's hard. It's no time that the whole seventh grade team can get together and just fellowship. But they say that's you know it's how can it's you? It's a huge part of uh, being yeah. a teacher. In a lot of ways, teachers teaching is a very isolating uh, job. You you go in your room, you close your door, and you're with your kids. I have no idea what's going on in the classroom next to me. Or anything, and the only time we get to sit down and talk about it is in these PLCs. Mm-hmm. But now that they, I mean, they're controlled now. We're told what we talk about, when we talk about it. Um, we have administrators from the state level all the way down to the county board office level, and they're listening. I made a joke, and it was a tongue in cheek joke. I said, PLCs used to be very intimate. You heard about teacher's failures you would say i mean i remember saying as a young teacher i was a science teacher i don't know how to teach this subject i didn't learn this in school and and that was that's one of those and i know as social studies teachers you know that too i mean you go to college and you major in science education well i specialized in life science education i ended up getting a job teaching physical science Mm -hmm. and so there was a lot it was a learning curve there and I didn't have a lot of background and you know I'm asked to teach this science that I I, I vaguely know and uh, the older teachers and and it it was very safe to say hey I don't understand how to teach balancing equations because I hadn't done it in years I'd never taught it I'd never been taught to how to teach it and the older teachers would give you strategies and ideas and learning things. But it's not safe now. Um, I watch the young teachers and and I watch them. And I watch the criticism they get from the admini- not Well, yeah, the administrators and the county level administrators and the state level administrators and the coaches. And everybody is there trying to show them how to teach. And when I step, when we step away... I look at them and I say, hey, now take a deep breath. That, and they feel attacked, obviously, all the time. I I think uh, even for some of the veteran teachers, you feel attacked. Yeah. Because they're telling you, you know how to teach. Done it for years. And all of a sudden, somebody's coming to you and say, hey, you try this idea, or you try this software, and it's going to work. And you sit there. You, my biggest criticism people have of me. And I'm just going to have to tell the whole world. I get criticized for being too quiet in meetings. Because honestly, I sit there and I just listen. Because this, what I've heard hearing today, I heard about 15, 20 years ago. It's just, you just changed the name. and But the only difference now, you might have some new software. Every year, it's a different program that you got to buy into. So it's like, okay. When are we just going to go to this classroom and teach? So you're saying that you actually get reprimanded for not speaking. I get reprimanded. They say I'm not a... uh, Your problem is you're not sharing ideas. So you're forced to talk. Right. I'm forced (laughs) to talk. Which, again, takes the safety out of the professional learning community. It is no longer a community when you're forced to talk. And mine is the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. I'm very blunt. I'm very... um, For instance, uh, the last PLC I attended, we were learning, or they were showing us how to use learning targets. And I looked at them. I said, wow, back in 94, I learned how to do this at University of Georgia. 
And the person teaching it became offended. I didn't really care. Um, And she tried to show me that it was different. And she gave me a standard that was out of my field. She gave me a math standard. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, if they taught it so well, you should be able to break this one down. And I looked at it and I did. And I broke it down well, too, by the way, Mm because I don't like a challenge. I don't like to be challenged on what I know I know how to do. I mean, there are a lot of things in education I need a lot more learning on and a lot more practice. But writing learning targets, not that hard. It shouldn't have been a two-hour meeting. And I mean, it was just, and it it was two hours over two days, but it was still too much. And um, I said, again, in 94, nothing of this is new. Even the younger teachers is like, yeah, we learned this in college. We don't understand why they were like, but you must write it in kid-friendly language. Okay, fine. But again, it is not that serious. And kids haven't changed that much. Nope, they hadn't changed that much. They're still kids and... Quite frankly, they're not going to change that much. Evolution takes thousands of years. And this whole concept that children have changed because technology has is so flawed. I don't get it. But anyway, PLCs, good or bad thing? Uh, the new version, bad. So how would you adjust it? I would adjust it once a week. Either you have either... You can have a grade level meeting or do a content. That's for middle school. Elementary, I would say just have a grade level meeting. Sit and talk. Um, Middle school, you don't need to meet with the whole seventh grade team. I would say if administrators from state level on down to the county level, on down to the building level, want to teach teachers new strategies or new ideas or uh, or new concepts, whatever you want to call them, um, they need to not call it a PLC because that's staff development. And taking a PLC and turning it into a staff development and saying we're just showing you how to do it um, is... Is arrogant. Yeah. It is very arrogant because teaching has been going on long before someone got their doctorate degree in professional learning communities and wrote a book. This was going on and it was doing well and it had its purpose and it was natural and fluent. And it even got to the point where PLCs got down to two teachers, mm-hmm. a younger teacher and an older teacher or two veteran teachers or even two younger teachers who Mm -hmm. knew how to work together and trusted each other because it is about trust. That's that community part. Um, I think we got caught up in the professional and the learning and we lost the community. But when you can get two or three teachers together who trust each other and feel safe, the, the, uh, the, uh, outcomes for students is so good. It is so positive and it's wonderful. As it stands right now in the state of Georgia, uh, professional learning communities have become professional learning mandates. And they do not live up to the community feeling or the community growth that we need. Mm -hmm. Well, that was us for today. That's it. Nice little short store. I mean, <laughs> nice little short podcast. But before we leave, I really want to say hello to Mr. Michael Benjamin, who listened to all our podcasts. Hey, hey, Mr. Benjamin, you were in a meeting with me the other day, and I didn't get a chance to speak because I was late over learning targets. <laughs> and you looked like I was thinking, wow, I know how to do this. But yeah, you were in yeah. there with me. It was funny. Yeah, Mr. Benjamin always making fun of me at meetings, he say, you know, I had, I had to stop looking at you because I look over at you and you're looking like you're about to tell these folks, I really know how to teach. Why are you wasting my time? And he said, several times I busted out laughing during meetings because I'm looking at you just studying laughing like Dr. Shipman, like, he just don't want to be here. But I'm there. I'm holding. I know how to sit in meetings and just go through it. Oh, and I want to add one thing because I've heard this from non-teachers well, if teachers aren't doing that, what would they be doing? That would be grading papers, planning dynamic lessons, um, calling parents. Oh, my God, calling parents, mm-hmm. emailing parents, um, taking care of the business that keeps your kids safe and well 
taught and well learned, um, I would be doing those things. I I don't want to say that PLCs have no place, but the way they're being used now has not been beneficial to the kids. And if it's not helping the kids at the end of the day, it's not helping. Right now, it is all about collecting data so that the state can give you money or not based on test scores. All we do is focus on test scores and PLCs. A quick, short example that we need that time. I walked in my room 10 minutes before the students came. Got to school, clocked in, went to my room, cut on the email. Three emails looking at me in the face. Uh, one, you need to add to the contact log that you talk to a parent. Two parents, I had to add. I'm like, okay, so one off I was supposed to. Two, put your last plans in. Three, an, uh, another email about a meeting that's coming up. Uh, the kid, another meeting about a kid's got to switch classrooms during first period. But the kid really enjoyed my first period because he enjoyed reading the story. So all this before the kids actually step to the door. You got to get this done and get ready for your first period class. And you still hadn't graded a paper. Uh, no, I you still a paper. hadn't um, look, built a relationship with a kid, planned anything special. It's kind of it's kind of sad at this point. But again, I think we do these podcasts for a couple of reasons. We do them. Um, Hopefully that more parents will learn what's really going on in schools and, and voice their concerns. Or, or even if you're not concerned, go and look and see what's going on with your te- your child's teacher. These are people that your kids spend eight hours a day with. Um, you really need to make sure your kids aren't being test guinea pigs for things that don't actually help them. Now, I mean, you really need to get in there. I sometimes don't think parents get... It can't be all the teacher's responsibility. Yeah, everybody has to do their part. Okay, Dr. Shipman. Yes, ma'am. Uh, it is November. It's November. And so I wanted to put in, you said it earlier, but I really wanted to say, please, everyone, go to Amazon.com, search Terrence Shipman. That's Terrence with one R. Um, and look at our book, Mr. Shipman's Kindergarten Chronicles. December Celebration. It's a delightful book. It is one of those books you can use the week before you get out of holiday almost every day. It covers three major December holidays. Hanukkah, Christmas, Kwanzaa. and Kwanzaa. Thank you. I couldn't remember the third one. And, you know, it, it definitely has potential for great lessons. Kids can learn about different cultures. Um... Writing assignments can be built around it. Fun projects. So please go look at that. I think you would find it's great. The book's target audience is generally second grade through lower reading sixth grade. Would you agree? I agree. Um, So it is definitely something that you could read to a class of students and have them write, develop projects and papers. Yeah. Um, research. So, and, and again, was, Amazon.com or TerrenceShipman.com. Or Amazon, Barnes & Nobles, Walmart.com. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, Walmart.com, iTunes, Google Google Plus Books. Because I, what I'm starting to find out, a lot of people don't have Amazon accounts. Wow. So, just go. You can pretty much go everywhere. Go online. You can find it. We're located with all and with all the big boys. And one of the funny comments I got uh, reviews uh, that, that came across last week was this: the parent gave it actually a full star. You know, so I always look at the ones to see why I got a full star. She said, "I love the book, but my kids it was my kids kept saying it was too long. Hear up, turn the page. We want to see the next pictures." Little kids. If I, and I keep saying this to people every time I we have this conversation about the books, the length of it. I say, hey, little kids, they are picture lookers. They really just like to look at the pictures. It's the adults who like to read or read the stories. Well, you know what would be fun? And I've never taught little people. Mm-hmm. But if I had it, I did. I do have a son who's 18 now. But I remember when he was little. And he would get that way with books. And I was like, well, BJ, that's his name. BJ, you tell me the story. Mm-hmm. And rather than trying to read to him, I, I am a big, I'm a big writer. You know that, Dr. Shipman. Mm-hmm. 
And I, I believe that creativity to a certain extent, but writing all the way can be taught. I think the first thing parents have to do when they teach writing and parents start teaching writing is just what I said. Let your kid's imagination turn on. You don't have to read a story to a five-year-old. Open the book and say, tell me the story. And they will stammer and stutter to start off with it. But I guarantee you, if you do it enough, they'll come back. It will stick with them. And it's like one of those things as adults they, 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 that you get a hold to. And you're like, I can do that better. I can do that better. And they'll come back and say, Mama, Daddy, I want to... I want, to, I want to tell you this story again. And they will add to it and they will start noticing detail. When kids do that, if you can teach them to hold on to their ability to add detail and organize details, you are teaching them to be good writers. Yeah. Let me tell you, I got a funny story. And then we got to get ready to wrap it up because we promised we were going to keep it short. But you know what? If we go longer, it's all right. So today... Miss, uh, one of my coworkers who whose child daughter has the book. He said, "I got to show you this picture. I got to show you this picture." I said, "All right, come on, show it to me." He he showed me this picture. His daughter was reading the first day of school. She was sleeping. The book was next to her. That was one of the best pictures I ever seen. He said, "See, she read your book so hard she fell asleep." Good. I love that. That's picture. beautiful. It That's was beautiful. Awesome. That's the way children should be, mm-hmm. and they have a lot pulling at them. So a good book. It's always good. Yep. All right, Dr. Shipman, can you close us up today? Yep, I'm going to close us up. Before I close us up, I got. I know we just keep talking. I got to say hi to these cities. These are the top 10 cities when it comes to our podcast. At number 10, we have Birmingham, Alabama. Go be ham. Houston, Texas. H-Town. Dallas, Fort Worth. All right, Dallas, Fort Worth. Los Angeles, California. L.A. in the house. Chicago, Chi-Town, Philadelphia, Phillies, San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose area. I love that place. Beautiful city. Oh, and coming in at number three, Washington, D.C. D.C. Hit it, baby. Number two, New York, New York. Hey, Khalil, New York, New York. And number one city that listened to our podcast is the A Town, Atlanta, Georgia. You can find me in the A. Yay, that is excellent. We're doing good with this. Keep us going, y'all. And Remember share. to share, subscribe, join, like, click on Sun on our pages. Click on Sun. Yeah. A heart, a thumb, something. Click on it. Keep us going. It was great talking to you, world. And as always, I am special, I am smart, I am somebody. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Bye, world. Mr. Shipman's class, Mr. Shipman's class.